Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, uh, Chapter 11 of the Spanish Civil War. So, <clears throat> I'm very curious about this topic. Now, the irony is this lecture is going to be relatively short, so you can't tell from the length of the lecture on my personal interest in this topic. So, the good news is, yeah, it's a relatively short lecture. We'll see how long it is, but it's relatively short. <clears throat> uh, not because it's not important, just... Um, I guess maybe give you guys a little bit of break and also let you guys kind of pursue your own views with this topic. So, um, but I do have a very strong personal connection with this topic. Let me scroll down a little bit. And uh, as you guys are getting comfortable with another lecture, so your beverage of choice. This time I just got some ice water. That's fine. I don't have a tea this time. You want to get home tonight, I'll get some iced tea. I don't have it right now, so ice water sounds good. In any case, uh, uh, let me give you guys a little background into how I got interested in this topic, and it goes way back to when I was your guys' age. So, uh, when I was, man, I think probably my junior year, I don't remember exactly, might have been my sophomore year, uh, I took a class, uh, I think it was a modern Europe class. It's scary, I haven't taken a minute trying to remember. <laughs> I love my professor in that time period. Um, maybe that's a conversation for another day, but I really liked him. He would typically teach sitting down. Um, he had a gray beard, wore glasses, wore a tweed coat and a tie, uh, and he would talk to us kind of a conversational way. He he lectured some, but uh, the class I remember the most was actually a quite small class, almost all history majors. We met in this old room, this old kind of classroom building with a wooden floor. There's a table there. Both walls are lined with books. It's a relatively small room. It wasn't really even a classroom. It was just a big kind of wooden table, chairs around it, and books on both sides, and just a couch, couple couches in there. It was really a lounge. It wasn't really a typical classroom. There's some big kind of bay windows looking out at the hill behind the campus. And uh, uh, and he required us to do oral presentations. And uh, I think I had just recently complete, completed uh, Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls which I highly recommend that book to you guys. I don't know if you guys have read Hemingway yet, but I highly recommend it. Uh, my college years, I was trying to read the classics besides all, all my school and course. Of course, I was trying to read classics one kind or another. And so I was working my way through some of Hemingway's most famous books. And uh, I think I read Phil Lord Phil of Arms. What else had I read of his? Anyways, I get to uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls. And that book is on the Spanish Civil War. That's a setting. Ernest Hemingway was a journalist in that war, and based on his experience in Spain, obviously he concocts a fictional story, but he was in Spain for quite a bit of the war. And uh, man, that story grabbed me. Loved it. Uh, it was romantic. I don't give you guys too much away, but Hemingway's stories tend to end, end in tears, so just FYI. <laughs> but it's a romantic story, uh, it's a story of adventure, the... The American hero who is a university professor but appeals, uh, hears a call to defeat fascism, leaves his job, journeys to Spain to fight against the fascists, and joins a guerrilla group, a partisan group. Uh, he's very good at explosives and he's sent on a mission, a suicidal mission, frankly, to blow up a bridge to try to slow down the fascist advance. And uh, I don't want to tell you too much about this story because if you guys are interested, I don't want to. I don't want to give you too many spoilers, but uh, in my oral presentation on the, in that class in the Spanish Civil War, um, it seems to me I read a quote from him and talked about that book, a couple of scenes that really grabbed me from that. There's many in there, by the way. Um, but one is a scene of uh, uh, Republican forces uh, executing or murdering, because they were already captured, so... It's really atrocity, but uh, hurling some captured nationalist forces, it seems to me, off a cliff or a bridge. It's a very vivid scene. The villagers all participated in that. Uh, it seems to me the main character, I think, is Robert Jordan. I think it's his name. He was bothered by that. And another scene that I used in my oral presentation was uh, a nationalist airstrike or bombing on some of Robert Jordan's Spanish colleagues who were on a hilltop. They had one machine gun and these uh, nationalist dive bombers died down on them and dropped bombs on them. And uh, 
eventually, you know, they're going to, again, I don't want to give too many spoilers, but it's probably not going to end so well. But the brilliance of how Hemingway described that, the terror of it, the heroism of it, the dramatic moment of it, of them fighting back despite not being very well armed against this overwhelming military modern machine, uh, but giving their lives for the cause they believed in. Um, yeah, it really grabbed me. I, it's been a long time, so that oral presentation is probably, man, 30 years ago now. <laughs> uh, but it fascinated me. And uh, uh, so much so that thinking back over the last couple of days, I watched a PBS documentary on Ernest Hemingway, which I recommend to you guys. I think it's a three or four part documentary. I think it came out two years ago during the pandemic. Uh, on Ernest Hemingway. If you guys are a historian, I know a lot of you guys are history historians, you got to watch. It's great. If you're not English major, be just fabulous. But you'll see some of what I'm talking about. But I got so creating this lecture, working on it a little bit, and thinking about it. Uh, I think I'm going to have to read that book again. <laughs> Go back to Hemingway. It's been a long time since I read Hemingway. But uh, Brings back a lot of memories. I want to go back with a little bit more mature vision and go back and read that classic work again. So, again, the setting for that, back to what we're talking about right now, was the Spanish Civil War. And, uh, and introducing the complexity of that war, the brother, brother against, brother against brother nature of the war, the atrocities and violence of that war, um, the foreign volunteers on both sides were a part of it, uh, prelude to World War II. The fighting for technology, I'm not fighting for the fighting with a new technology, um, all those things, uh, and more. Besides Hemingway being a brilliant writer and bringing that subject so powerfully to life, just pulsating with life, and that got me interested in the Spanish Civil War. Then a lot of years passed, and um, so and to continue on, um, a lot of years rolled by. So I read. I did, I did for the oral presentation when I was a freshman, I guess a ju sophomore, junior, whatever it was. Um, I read some books that time as well, and I, I read Arthur, Arthur Kostler's uh, Darkness at Noon, which, by the way, as you guys know, is not about the Spanish Civil War. That's about Stalin's purges. But he, Arthur Kostler, as you guys know, from the reading you guys did this week, A Dialogue with Death, and then his I Was Right to Be Converted, um, he has a lot to say about the Spanish Civil War and that general era, too, as you guys know from, from your readings. Um, but anyways, so a lot of years rolled by. I did my graduate research had nothing to do with Spain, and uh, the rest of my academic career had nothing to do with Spain. So years and years rolled by. I wasn't, I wasn't interested. You know, just how light we're busy, right? And that story, got a lot of things going, other things going on. And then uh, back in 2017, my family took... Uh, a vacation slash family trip to see all my in-laws in South Korea, my mother-in-law and uh, the rest of my uh, Korean side of my family there because my wife. And uh, while I was there, uh, this is the book I took along to read, among others, which you guys might recognize. <laughs> Looks kind of familiar. Love this book. Had a great time reading it when I was there. Did a lot of annotating and highlighting, and uh, now I'm dragging you guys to this book. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed it. I loved it. I was fascinated by, I knew some of that already as a historian, but there's details I did not know. And I came across that part about George Orwell in Spain. And uh, as you guys know, fighting for the poem, gets wounded, shot in the neck, nearly dies, but nearly bleeds out. But amazingly, the bullet somehow goes to his neck and doesn't kill him. Could have, you know, I mean, a millimeter either way. Survives that and gets in the hospital. It's not great, as you guys know, but covers, gets his voice back a little bit, and finally gets back to Barcelona to see his wife. And you're just like, woo, yeah, man, it's amazing. And then, as you guys know, it's so dramatic. He goes in to see his wife, and uh, and she's like, she gives him a hug, right, in the in the hotel lobby, and she's like, you got to go. He's like, what? You got to go. And, and and as you guys know, right, because the poem, who he had joined, it's a a pro-Trotskyist communist offshoot. Um, and you guys know in the world of Stalin, there are no offshoots, not for long, not living ones. There's dead ones, but not living ones. And that poem is being purged, as you guys know, and he flees out the back door, one of the hotel employees, she sees him, likes him, also tell him, like, you gotta get out of here. And man, I was hooked, and I thought, man. And then realizing, I, I read more to Rick's, that he, 
he's recalling because Ricks didn't come up nowhere, right? That Ricks is recalling the famous autobiography of George Orwell, Homage to Catalonia, which is right here. And I was like, I gotta read it. It's been all these years. I want to go back to Spain and gotta check it out. So I did. Went on Amazon, ordered Homage to Catalonia, read it, loved it. And I was like, I want to know more. And Spain and 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 Orwell, very unusually at the start of the book reminds his reader, which is very rare for an author, to say my book is not enough. He tells me, like, look, I'm saying my book, he said my book is just my experience, just what I saw, what I experienced, my perceptions, but there's much the story, of course, I did not see personally, and I don't know, so you should definitely pursue other sources as well as my book. Authors rarely say that, but he's just up front saying you got to read other books. You know, my book is not enough. It's just my experience, what I saw. I think it's valuable, insightful, and by, it is. It's a classic. But there's other books. So I was like, okay, well, started doing a little research and I came across The Battle for Spain by Anthony Beaver. And uh, this book is highly recommended, won a bunch of awards, dove in, fascinating, loved it. Not done. And I said, I need to keep going. And then I found The Spain of Hearts by Adam Horschild, Americans in the Spanish Civil War. And I uh, read that after that. And uh, and then I, I wasn't still not done, but I thought I got to read other things. <laughs> I story these lots of subjects, and I got to move to other topics, and I did. I thought I got to move on. But all of that's to say, that's how the historians' minds work: is you follow something that excites you, engages you, draws you in. The drama of the human experience and an important experience. There's a lot there. So all the stuff I just told you is not going to be on the exam. <laughs> just the reality of. I define something so curious, and this window opens, right? This window to another world opens up, and I, I got to go through that window and see where this adventure takes me. And uh, that's my interest in the Spanish Civil War. And with that, we're going to get to my sh relatively short lecture on the Spanish Civil War. Uh, but the reason I mention all that is I hope you guys, and have to be Spanish Civil War, by the way, although I would recommend all these books, fabulous, for whom the bell tolls, him anyway, almost Catalonia, classic, the rest of these books, fabulous. Anthony Beaver is an amazing historian. I've already mentioned him earlier. He's had some very good books, one just recently on the Russian Civil War. He's written on Stalingrad, Battle of Army Arnhem. Uh, he's written a bunch of stuff. That guy, I don't know how he has time to sleep. He's a very talented historian. He's a good interview. You can find him on YouTube talking about his history. He's great. I have a lot of admiration. Adam Horschild is also very good, too. Um, <laughs> but my thought is, for you guys, I hope you guys find something in this class that really engages you and you pursue. I think I mentioned to you guys in an earlier lecture, I'm also currently reading um, Isaac Babel's Red Calvary, which I had frankly had never heard before until I started researching for this class. And actually, I take that back. I was reading a book last fall before I really started researching for this class uh, by a, a writer named Kayim Potuk, who passed away here a number of years ago. He wrote some very influential books in my education called The Promise, The Chosen. He's a Jewish American writer talk about the intersection of different communities and how those come together. Um, and I was fascinated by that. And I, I was reading his last book called Old Men at Midnight, fabulous title. And he has a character in there, a fictional character, but a fictional character is doing her doctoral dissertation. And it's in part on Isaac Babel's Red Calvary. That was the first time I came across that book. And then studying Ukrainian history all last fall, I came across it again, and then the Russian Civil War, and uh, yeah, anyways, that's enough of that. <laughs> but fascinating, fascinating, and uh, I wish I had time to get into that book too, because I read a couple of very powerful short stories by Isaac Babel about the, the war there in Ukraine, between Russia, Poland, and taking place on Ukrainian soil, and uh, yeah, just uh, anti-Semitism, and pogroms, and massacre, just uh, brilliant, tragic, uh, in any case, back to the Spanish Civil War, 1936 to 39. This is an iconic painting by Pablo Picasso of Guernica on that terrible bombing raid on the small city of Guernica and uh, his response, which is, by the way, it's a massive painting, um, response to that terrible terror bombing and trying to visualize the core of modern warfare on civilians. It's a very fitting image when you talk about the Spanish Civil War. And kind of continuing that, uh, 
these two photographs. The one on the left actually is showing a mass of soldiers who have just captured some Republicans. They're kind of hard to see here. I think they're up ahead in the line right here. These are the Natchez soldiers right here. And they got into a Republican-held town and rounded up a bunch of the men. And the women are justifiably terrified that the men are going to be taken out of town and probably immediately gunned down. And you can see they're all with their hands up in the air imploring them, don't do this. And they're, they're right to be worried because tragically, the Spanish Civil War, it's a brother against brother, sister against sister, so it's ideological war, and ideological wars oftentimes tend to be some of the worst. Now, other wars can be horrible too. Ideological means neighbor against neighbor. And that photograph there is two young girls in Madrid watching for fascist bombers coming over Madrid during the siege of Madrid. Again, uh, initiation into modern aero combat and bombing, which would be so horribly common in a nightmare of World War II, but it's really in the Spanish Civil War where really getting acquainted with that. Now there's some in World War I, but there was not a lot of heavy strategic bombing in World War I. I'll get it. There were some. But the Spanish Civil War is where the modern form that you and I would be uh, familiar with and terrified of uh, becomes really a reality. And you see it in those two girls' faces hiding under that looks like a drainage uh, ditch beneath the bridge looking up into the sky with uh, fear. One more example of this, and uh, again, uh, human rights feel out of arms, I, I imagine probably maybe partially drawn from real events, even though his book, book, book is fictional. But uh, there's a famous bridge uh, in Spain called Piente Nuvo. Don't quote me on that Spanish pronunciation, by the way. <laughs> I did my best there. But uh, And I've seen this in travel brochures, and I've seen this on TV programs. It's an amazing bridge. It splits the town of Ronda. Again, my pronunciation probably is not quite right. Uh, in two, there's this... Uh, canyon or chasm that uh, that uh, with the river flowing through the town and so kind of in the middle of town you just have this very dramatic canyon and that bridge there arched over the canyon connecting the two parts of town. It's a very dramatic thing. It's on my list of places to go for many places. I would love to visit Spain. I've been to some places in Europe. I have not been to Spain. It's on my list. I'd love to get there. I'd like to get this location too because it's spectacular. But in the context of Spanish Civil War, you guys probably can guess what's coming. It's also a site of allegedly massacres by both sides of the nationalists pushing, well, probably, probably the reverse, Republicans pushing nationalist prisoners off that bridge to their death in the canyon below. And then later on, as the nationalists seize greater control, the nationalists reversing that and seizing uh, Republicans and throwing them off that picturesque bridge. But in the context of that, obviously, it has a ghoulish kind of thought of... Uh, of both sides massacring uh, prisoners committing atrocities on this uh, sightseeing landmark and having a very dark history allegedly during the Spanish Civil War. But I chose to put that in there to give you a sense of the stakes involved on both sides and, uh, and, and the darkness that sends oftentimes on both sides when they capture the enemy in the Spanish Civil War. All right, so Spanish Civil War, it is a civil war. It goes from 1936 to 39, and let's break that down here just briefly. And again, this will be a general description of the war. Uh, this will be a relatively short lecture um, as I'm getting into this again. So there's much for you guys on your own if you're curious. There's so much those books are recommended, but there's all kinds of good sources to look more about this war. But so it's a, a, a civil war between the general left, which we refer to as the Republic. Now, the public is made up of a coalition of communists, socialists, anarch anarchists, and some liberal democrats, all in this very loose, ill-fitting, and frankly dysfunctional coalition. Um, some of those things, frankly, don't go together very well. For example, communists, socialists, and anar anarchists, democratic liberals, there's problems there. That just, there just is. For example, like anarchists, even though anarchists are a leftist group, but anarchists, by definition, are not organized and resist a centralized government. Whereas communists, as you guys know, are very centralized. Now, maybe not in theory in the future, but in the early form, at no question, they're very centralized and a very strong party. For an anarchist, that's a no. Same thing for a liberal. You want to vote on things where it would be open democratic process discussion. That's not what the communists are doing. And then the socialists are all the own kind of, kind of foot both sides of that. 
So it's a very loose, ill-fitting, and, and by way worse, as you'll see in a little bit, not just ill-fitting, uh, devouring their own attempt at a coalition that frankly is not going to work long term. On the right, you have the nationalists, and they're backed by a group of fascist, traditional conservatives, and Catholics. By the way, some of those overlapping. I'm not saying Catholics separate from fascists. Sometimes they overlap. But I'm saying the traditional church, traditional conservatism, traditional monarchism, all that kind of pools together and is going to be part of the fascist side in this war. Now, additionally, as you guys are probably well, well aware, that's within Spain. The course of war is not just in Spain. It is in many ways also a proxy international war. For the international left, which supports the Republic, backed directly by the Soviet Union and left to supporters from many countries, including the United States, as I'll show you here in a minute. And that's on the one side. And on the other side, the international right also supports the nationalists or the fascists. Um, and that's going to be Germany and Italy. And Germany and Italy will be much more directly involved uh, supplying machines, equipment, money, and, and military expertise. And in the case of Italy, a significant number of soldiers. Uh, Nazi Germany does provide some very talented aerial units and a limited amount of soldiers, not a lot of ground troops though. But there are air force that contribute on both the Italians and the Germans is going to play a major role in the success of the nationalists in winning this war. An example of that international uh, involvement is on the left here, this photograph you see right here, that's an early German bomber, it's a Heinkel 111. It's part of the Condor Legion. That was the nickname given to the, or the name given to the Nazi uh, Air Force units that are sent from Nazi Germany to Spain, and they play a major role in the war because they're very good. They have the most modern planes, um, and they also are important training for what's going to happen in World War II. So that's actually a, a win-win in Hitler's eyes. Not only does the fascist eventually win, which is Franco's side of the nationalist, but his Air Force gets an early baptism and combat and experience with the modern form of aerial warfare in the Spanish Civil War. Now on the right, you have an example of the international left. And actually, it's a photograph of a part of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade or Battalion. These are almost all American volunteers. Uh, there's two nearly all American volunteer units that fight in the Spanish Civil War on the Republican side, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade and the uh, I'm drawing a blank on the other one. Washington? I'll look it up. In any case, Abraham Lincoln is the most famous, but there's another one too. In any case, it shows them, and, and by the way, when you look close on that photograph, you can see the kind of reality on, on, the, on the left here, on the Republican side is some of those guys have uniforms, some don't, some have combat helmets, some have berets, some have whatever hat they feel like wearing, some don't have a hat at all. That is the Republican side. <laughs> uh, a lot of enthusiasm, very energized to fight against fascism. They feel that's the, the core. They must stop this darkest descent on Europe. And so many of them volunteer. Well, I see all of these in the international brigades volunteer. Uh, they, they leave their life and safety back home, journey across, halfway across the world, end up in Spain to fight for the public and cause and take very heavy casualties in the process. So background to the war. Uh, Spain... Uh, of of all the European countries, I wouldn't say it has the biggest struggles, but it would be in that category some of the biggest struggles. Spain, prior to, say, World War One, but even after that, uh, has a very poor economy, uh, a really struggling with mass education, is not doing a very good job of, of educating the general public, deep, deep class divisions, and in many ways, Spain is still locked in a time war. Just as you guys know, Soviet Russia was. I should not Soviet. Tsarist Russia was locked, locked in a time war. In some ways, Spain is too. England, say France, and Germany are vastly ahead of Spain in, on almost every matrix of uh, modernization. Uh, Fran uh, Spain also lacks a stable political environment. There had already been a lot of pressure for some kind of modernization campaign of one kind or another. And by the way, that's why it gets complicated because in Spain, there's a whole variety. Is, is that going to be a communist? Is it going to be the Bolshevik style revolution sweep away a uh, traditional, almost feudal Spain? Is it going to be a liberal democratic, something that would be similar to taking place in England or France or the United States? Is it going to be a socialist? Is it going to be anarchist? Uh, 
is it going to be go which continue with a monarchy of some kind or a very conservative style government where the aristocracy can as you run Spain and uh, what's it going to be? And the answer is they didn't know. So a lot of instability, um, seething resentments from many uh, over these uh, the lack of development, the lack of rights, lack of education, the lack of any kind of economic hope for better conditions. Of course, the conservatives are very afraid there's going to be some kind of leftist revolution in Spain that will destroy traditional Spanish culture in general. For example, the Catholic Church, because as you guys know, communism and socialism and anarchism too, all three of those view religion quite negatively to say the least. Now, that's to say the least. So some are, out, are aggressively hostile toward religion. And you'll see that in the Spanish Civil War. Aggressively hostile. So if you're a devout Catholic, obviously for the people like that, they're deeply fearful. And Catholicism is still an important factor, of course, in Spain. And uh, I'm not going to do a play-by-play -play of the war. I thought about it. If I had more time, I would, because I'm fascinated by this war. And uh, there's so much drama there and heartache and all that. But uh, we're gonna, I'm going to talk majorly just the larger themes and the play-by-play -play of the war you'll have to pursue on your own. So <laughs> if that's good news for you guys. You're not in the military history. You're not going to worry about that for this war. So it breaks out in July 19, uh, 1936 in, in, in the... the Fascist or nationalist under Franco and his conservative supporters feeling that the government is going, becoming increasingly left wing. But that's not necessarily wrong, even because the left wing pretty much had won the recent elections. But fearful that things are going to accelerate in a negative way toward the left. The right fearful that decided to launch a military coup to seize control of the direction of the company, country, company, country. Um, and that coup fails in its initial hope to seize control of the government outright, which is what we call today the Republican government. And they were elected, although it's a very close election, by the way. Um, so their initial plan was a rapid military coup, and they just simply seize power and put them, their conservative vision in place. But the initial hope for that seizure of power does not work. Now, they do seize significant portions of the country. And so the Spanish Civil War really is a continuation of the coup attempt into a civil war because the coup attempt to seize control, for example, of Madrid and the country rapidly, that's going to fail. But it does not fail in the sense that they do seize significant portions of the country and then just it turns into a regular war, civil war in which there are a slow moving, I guess you almost call it a slow moving cool coup that eventually, after some very hard warfare, eventually succeeds. That's not technically a coup, because a coup means a fairly rapid military takeover and it's done. So the coup in that sense fails, but long term, I guess you have to say it succeeded, because eventually the nationalist or the fascist would win control of the government. It took them much, much longer than planned, um, and they would not do it until, you say, April 1939, but they eventually will take over the entire country, which was their initial hope in the initial coup. The photographs you see, again, are kind of indicative of a bit of, of both sides. On the left, you have some Republican militia. Uh, the Republicans probably initially had the greater numbers of Spanish population on their side just through sheer numbers, but they did not have much of what you call the regular army. Most regular armies tend to be more cons uh, conservative. At the start of the coup, a lot of the regular army went with the nationalist or Franco or the fascist, however you want to kind of separate. Well, not separate. It's all really the same, the same thing. Whereas a lot of the, of course, the, the communists, the socialists, the anarchy, liberal democrats, all those rallied to protect the elected government, which is the Republican government. Um, but many of them, again, are not necessarily professional soldiers, as you see here in that photograph. A lot of these guys are very gung ho. You can see them laughing and smiling. They're la be glad to be doing what they're doing. But you see it's a motley crew. It looks like a bunch of pirates or something, right? It's just a lot of people don't have military training, but they, they're, they're gung ho to fight. They want to protect the Republic. On the right, that's uh, the fl the flange. The flange is uh, nationalist militia, and they all have their uniforms. You see there, and it gets more sense. You can see more of a uh, more of a explicit visual military representation, even, and that that makes sense too. Because you know, a lot of the regular army would stay under the nationalist or the fascist. So I'm going to share just a little bit from a historian Anthony Beaver's perception of the Spanish Civil War. There's a lot to his his, his book. I'm not going to break down his entire thesis and all that. I just want to share a couple things briefly from him that I think are helpful. And let me highlight this for you guys because you definitely want to know this. So give me a second here to highlight this. There we go. Okay, there we go. So 
This is a direct quote from him in his introduction. Beaver writes, uh, Beaver writes, the Spanish Civil War is often the trade of clash between left and right. That's a rightly so. But then he adds, but this is a misleading simplification. The two other acts of conflict emerge. State centralism against regional independence. What he means by that is, for example, Catalonia and some other regions, uh, and the Basque region, both those regions really, now they're part of the Republic, but they would also like to do their own thing too. Both of them have strong regional hopes for independence. So when he says state centralism, that means uh, a traditional monarchist or central state that controls everything. By the way, that could be left or right, by the way, but the central state just controls everything or certain regions hoping for some level of, of partial independence or outright independence, think the Basque region, northern Spain, or Catalonia around Barcelona. And then the third factor there is authoritarianism against freedom of the individual. Again, that's not necessarily a left-right thing per se, because both left and right have very strong authoritarian tendencies. Certainly the fascists, by definition, nationalists, have no problem with a certain level of authoritarianism. Um, and the communists certainly have no problem with that on the left. The, the socialists, to some degree, not as comfortable as the communists, but some degree socialists are okay with that. But certainly not okay with that are the anarchist groups, which are relatively quite large. Not the majority, but, but still significant. Anarchists, not okay with that. They're very much on freedom of the individual. Same thing for uh, Spanish citizens who wanted some kind of liberal democracy similar to what you'd have in France or England or the United States. Also, stress it, freedom of the, the individual. The nationalist forces, and uh, I don't get lost here because I know Spanish Civil War, if you said it before, can get a bit confusing, all these writing names and groups and so forth. Um, but I will say, in general, though, the nationalists, and this is what we were saying, are right wing, yes, the centralists. They don't have a problem with the central government controlling things. And authoritarian, authoritarian yep. And uh, there are various militias within the nationalist cause. But they're largely on the same page. Not maybe a little bit of jealousy and stuff, but they're but because they are authoritarian and centralist, there's not a lot of internal conflict uh, on the national side. There's some, there's some, but not a lot of intent. So, for example, you see the the, the flags, the flange there on the left, which shows a yoke there, and it shows arrows. Arrows are this is an ancient, more ancient Spanish symbol, but that means the killing heretics. Well, again, gives the idea of the almost medieval flavor of some of the nationalist side. The idea of killing heretics in the 20th century. That's what the arrows are for. And the yoke, I believe, is to make sure... I need to look up the yoke. I'm drawing a blank what the yoke's for. The flag in the middle are the Carlists. They're also a conservative, traditional militia, but both of them are quite cooperative for the most part <coughs> under the nationalist or, or fascist cause. And that's the flag there of the nationalist government, which ultimately, you guys know, is going to ultimately win the war. Now, on the Republican side, there's a big coalition, uh, and we could spend a deep dive on this, but we're not going to try to make it relatively simple, but it's a coalition of a bunch of groups. Some of them are centralist, the communists, for example, some authoritarian, again, the communists, to some degree, some are socialist, uh, but some are regionalist. And again, think of the region around Catalonia, Barcelona and the Basque region, northern Spain, and some are libertarian. Libertarians, again, of course, that's going to be the anarchists, and that's going to be liberal Democrats. The flags there, that flag there on the left is a popular front that has that kind of a, I guess it's kind of a star, but that's a popular front. Popular front, popular front is an umbrella group trying to bring in all left-wing groups into a general coalition against fascism. Eventually, the popular group is going to break down because the communists probably want to control that indirectly, and the popular group, at least in theory, is an umbrella organization where we're all on the same page as leftists. But it turns out Stalin doesn't play a fair game, so eventually the popular groups can break down. But in this time period, though, still active. The CNT there, that is a socialist group, socialist anarchist, by the way. So it's kind of socialist anarchist group. Um, that's a, a communist, uh, uh, communist uh, group of Spain or communist party of Spain. 
the photograph there in the middle shows a bunch of, uh, I think there's a largely socialist anarchist early in the fighting. You can see the women on the truck there. Again, that's because it was a coup, right? And so you have in almost every major city in Spain, you have small groups of national soldiers trying to seize control of municipal power stations, city hall, the telephone exchange, etc. And so it requires just the average citizens, again, many of them are socialist groups, anarchist groups, communist groups, liberal Democrats, to rush home, get a gun, if you have a gun, or, or go get one, and join these citizen armies that just rise up um, quickly in order to combat the takeover of the nation in this coup attempt by the nationalists. On the right there, you have a group called the PUM, which I mentioned in the start of this lecture, that uh, Orwell is going to join in fighting. That's who he's part of, as you guys read in Tom Rick's book. Um, you guys know eventually they're going to be purged. And that's a whole other story what happens to Orwell, as you guys know, the drama of that story. When he, co when he comes in the hotel room after being shot in the neck by a sniper, and his wife is like, they're purging the group of which you joined. <laughs> it wasn't necessarily that Orwell was deeply committed to the specific philosophy of the poem. The poem is a, they're a communist group, but they're not mainstream communists or an offshoot. They're a follower of General Trotsky. And they have a kind of Trotsky criticism of Stalinism in Russia. Not a communism per se, but the way it's being pursued by Stalin. They're quite critical of that. Of course, Stalin's not having that, so he makes sure they're, they're purged. But since uh, George Orwell, or Eric Blair, his real name, since he had joined a Pulm militia, and that's where he's at the front lines, he's in the Pulm unit, uh, even though he's a socialist, but you know, he doesn't necessarily agree with everything the Pulm stands for. But he's a but he's and he's on the left, so he's comfortable with them. That's fine, and he's excited by the, the socialist I mean, the anarchist revolution in Barcelona. So he kind of joins them. It's fine, but since his name is on the rolls, that's all you need to know, and he's on the kill list. But it lets you know part of the problem: the Republican side, the Republicans are busy at times, not all the time, obviously, but in fighting internally, greatly weakens the Republican cause. You probably cannot overstate the importance of the Republicans struggling. They had a variety of struggles. They're trying to get arms from abroad and a whole variety of things. But the internal conflicts, without a doubt, weaken them. I'm not saying it's the most important factor why they lost, but it'd have to be in the top couple if it's not number one. Maps of the war. I mentioned initially that Franco's army is going to come here from Spanish Morocco, where most. Uh, Spanish regular military units had been prior to the start of the coup. They'll be flown across the Straits of Gibraltar, and they're going to try to rapidly roll the country in this coup attempt. And they're going to fail in all the areas you guys see there in the yellow. They might have an uprising there, but the local um, anarchist or socialist or communist, whoever is going to, those militias are going to crush those uprisings, and the republic is going to control a single portion of the country. In fact, actually, this map is even better. Initially, at the start of this, um, the Republic controlled the majority of Spain. Now, the areas in blue are controlled by Franco's uh, nationalists. But as the war progresses, a bit, you see it in the succession of these maps right here, gradually the blue area, which is controlled by the nationalists or the fascists, is going to gradually get bigger and bigger, begin to squeeze and squeeze down on the Republican-held areas until eventually uh, the war comes to an end uh, with the defeat of the Republic. This map shows you scenes of major fighting and bombing campaigns by both sides during the war. All right, and I, I did promise you a short lecture, so I'm going to try to hold to that. So, cost and course of Spanish Civil War, and this is a section I was working on, but I didn't really even finish it, so you, you guys are good. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I like this image a lot because uh, symbolically you see uh, an anarchist lady, Marina, Jacinita, something close to that, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, and just one example, because I'm sure uh, a month or two prior to this, she's not carrying a rifle to the city slung over her shoulder, but feeling that the Republic's under assault by the fascists, she's going to risk her life to protect the Republic. So now she's part of the militia, in this case, an anarchist militia. Excited. Maybe the revolution's come. Uh, and now the anarchists could be in charge in this place. And by the way, this is the only place really in the 20th century where the anarchists, at least for a brief time, were able to, again, only briefly kind of begin to set up a society that they envisioned as their utopia. Now, again, they didn't have time for the whole anarchist vision. They didn't have time for that. So, But there's only time really in the whole 20th century where there's even, I say, a partial 
and only regional, but a personal regional attempt by an anarchist group to begin to implement the image what they view as a, of an anarchist society, and they got a little bit of start, for example, around Barcelona and so forth. But again, but it was never what they uh, anarchists really wanted. It just kind of started that. Okay, so you have that that optimism, that excitement on the left. We're defending the republic, and also this this revolution that we're we're trying to enact and to change feudal Spain into this this you know, utopia of anarchism. And then on the right, you have the next generation, the cutting edge generation of military technology with the German Messerschmitt uh, 109, which is an iconic fighter of World War II, but is obviously a couple years earlier. So when that came out, it's one of the best planes in the world, bar none. So it's, Spitfire is very good too, of course, in England. So I'm not saying it's the best, but it was very, very good and far better when that came out than any airplane that the Republicans had. That's on the nationalist side. You guys don't recognize that, but this is a nationalist a markings on that plane. It'd be flown by German pilots. If you Spanish pilots, but almost all from the Condor Legion, these would be German pilots flying them. Very good German pilots. And again, that fighter is vastly superior speed wise, climb technology to anything the Republicans had to put in the air. And that shows you the, the foreign involvement, in this case, Germany and Italy, uh, pouring a great deal of assistance, much more direct assistance than what the Republicans ever received. Now, Stalin on the Republican side, Stalin did provide quite a bit of material and trainers and military expertise to the Republicans, but he, the Republicans had to pay for all of it. And none was given to them. And then you also have the, the split factor, Stalin wanted to control things. For example, the NKVD was very active in Spain with executions. Not Russia, no, it's in Spain. But in Spain, NKVD is getting rid of people. Again, typically people who saw him viewed as a threat of one kind or another to him. So it could be anarchists, could be members of the poem, etc. Uh, the leftist uprising, part of the, the intensity of that warfare is a leftist, especially the, the communists and the, the anarchists, the socialists, are very anti religious as I mentioned earlier. That's a scene there. We have a bunch of a ragtag group of uh, Republican militia firing at that statue of Christ. As many churches that they destroyed are stripped out of all its church iconography. Um, some priests and nuns were executed. Now, some of that was exaggerated by the nationalists, but there's no question that some of that happened because there was a great deal of anger toward the Catholic Church, which was considered a, a beacon, not beacon, a, a repository of conservatism, of the old order, and all that the, the, the far left was angry about. And the Catholic Church is seeing a part of that uh, mind control establishment of the far right as, a, as they viewed it. Now, the, the downside is you, they lost a lot of international sympathy because when international leaders are hearing about Republican forces going into a church and shooting the priest, maybe raping some nuns. Again, sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not true, sometimes it's exaggerated. But those reports getting out to the larger world, including the United States, means you're going to lose sympathy from certain uncommitted people in the political center who hear about these atrocities and are appalled and shocked by them. Again, on the right there to show you the nature of the Republican cause, you see there's some young ladies there, even got their hair done, but they're out rifles and sandbags if we get early in the fighting, uh, when, the, when they feel the Republican life is, lifeline is in their hands and they have to fight to protect it from the coup attempt by the nationalists. And I get another example there of Republican troops surrendering the Spanish Civil War. I'm not sure where those guys are going to survive. Both sides have pretty dismal records of shooting prisoners. Again, you guys read some of that. Arthur Costler, when he's captured being a leftist himself and a communist, he's captured by the nationalists. And you guys read that part where he, day after day, he's talking about people being taken out in the peace dialogue of death and being shot. They all get trials, right? They all get trials. <laughs> yeah, very brief trials. Uh, you're so and so? Yes, I am. And uh, you, okay, so. Uh, we pronounce you guilty. We found you guilty. You'll be executed. Eventually, as you guys know, uh, probably the combination of the, all that direct assistance from Germany and Italy, which gave much more direct assistance and ongoing. Stalin was kind of half-hearted. He'd give some assistance and pull it back. He made the Spanish Republic pay for everything. There's no free gifts to them. Not to mention the communists want to take over things, run things the way they want to. That means eliminating certain groups that see as threats. Um, the poem most famously, but not just them, other groups too. So the Russian involvement on the Republican side is a very, a very, very mixed record. They did give them some good fighter planes and bombers and some tanks, armored cars and so forth. 
and some Soviet uh, advisors. Helpful, good. You need to pay for all that stuff. But then you have the dysfunctional, interceding, internal fighting, oftentimes secretly being done by the NKVD, Russian control, control of information. Uh, I didn't mention this yet because of time, but uh, this is also a wonderful example. In fact, Anthony Bieber has a whole chapter in his history of the Battle for Spain, talking about how both sides manipulated the press, told half truths. Uh, both sides have very committed reporters who, especially many of them by on the Republican side, as you guys might know, for example, Hemingway and so forth, but many of them are uh, so caught up with the, the personal nature of the war, I mean, so rooting for their one side that they lost contact with truth and reality. That's why Orwell's landmark almost Catalonia is so powerful because he is a leftist, goes to Spain as a volunteer, like many of the volunteers, to fight against fascism. And his leftist brothers almost kill him. If the, if, the, if the Spanish police would have caught him there in Barcelona, he would have got a bullet at some point. And probably his wife too. And that's his fellow, <laughs> that's his allies. Absurdly. And of course, that, that bothers uh, him so much. And also as a, as a writer and independent thinker, as you guys know from me and Tom Ricks, He's also bothered because he knows some of the things he's reading in the Republican press. By the way, he's a, he's a, he's a Republican, right? But things, some of the things he's reading in the Republican press he knows are not true. Like, this is a lie. It bothers him. Now, he still is a Republican. That does not change. But he wants the truth. He wants the unvarnished truth so we can adapt. And, and the, both sides play at the ve very best fast and loose with the truth, oftentimes disguise things. And, of course, if you're not being honest, you can't fix things. It's a big problem for the Republicans. The Republicans will launch some offensive. They'll say they won the offensive. They did not win the offensive. Maybe turn into a bloodbath. But they'll tell their followers we did. And so no changes that are made because what we're doing is working. Well, no, it's not working. But you don't know that because you read the Spanish I mean, the Republican newspapers. You told that last offense, offensive was a big success. You don't need to retool anything. You don't need to up your game. You don't need to get a new general or new tactics. No, because you won. But you didn't win. And so there's no positive, uh, proactive analysis of problems and fixing those problems because reality does not intrude on what you want to be true. That's a universal problem. We talked about that in earlier lectures too. But uh, at all costs, and certainly Ricks emphasizes that, saying at all costs to see clearly reality, not what you want to be true, what is true. The Nationalists eventually win this war. That's Franco as a young man, well, not, yeah, that young, middle-aged man there on the left, and you can see Franco and with Hitler right there to visit by uh, Germany and visiting Franco. And you see all the Nazi soldiers lined up. Helpful, because again, without the help of Germany and Italy, perhaps doubtful that the nationalists could have won the Civil War. But they were given a great deal of assistance and help. Uh, the Republicans are not, are, there's an international embargo on most people, for example, the United States, Great Britain, France will not directly help the Republic. They're torn. I think they're sympathetic, but they also see the communists there. That bothers them. They're probably bothered a bit by the socialists at some degree too, but especially the communists. And so most of us in Europe takes a hands-off policy. Now, a lot of individuals, volunteers go to the Republican side, as you guys know. But uh, governments on the whole steer clear with the exception of the Soviet Union. Again, and that's a mixed bag. Their assistance comes at a very high cost. I promised you a short lecture, and it's not that short after all. I guess I, I got too excited about <laughs> recalling my my fascination with this topic, but we are, we are basically done here. So, so recommendations for you guys. I already recommend a couple of these. I would recommend, you can take whatever path you want, but if you're curious, I'd recommend me a wonderful place to start with the Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls. That was my my fascinating introduction to the war. Um, off the cost of Dialogue of Death would be a great place to go. Uh, for a larger overview of the war, Anthony Beaver's The Battle for Spain would be a really good place to start. This book is highly recommended. Obviously, clearly, George Orwell's Almost Catalonia would be a good start. Now, obviously, you've got some of that here. Uh, Spain or Hearts by Adam Horshaw. That's American. So you guys might enjoy that one, too, because that's primarily focused on a, a, a select number of Americans leave their life in America and go to Spain to fight and what happens to them. Some of them, of course, are killed in the fighting, and some survive and come back home. But it just shows you how 
appealing in a sense to certain Americans, many of them who are American leftists, not surprisingly, but who gave everything for the Republican cause. Some of them would come back very proud of the service. Others would come back a bit, a bit disillusioned, like George Orwell. Most of them don't come back unhappy to have served. Most of them are very proud to have served, but they survived, obviously. But some would come back jaded and angry about what they saw on their own side as well. So their hatred and fear and rejection of fascism is just as strong, but also begin to question uh, what's taking place in communism because of what they saw in Spain. And another fun read would be Hotel Flores, the Truth, Love, and the Death in Spanish Civil War by Amanda Vale. That's where a lot of these international correspondents of all kinds, most famously Hemingway, but not just him, him and other very prominent photographers, artists, writers, journalists, are staying in this one hotel there at Madrid. I think that'd be a good read for you guys, too, if you are interested. And uh, again, why this was so interesting to me, and I'll wrap it up here, but... Uh, Orwell never, almost, as you guys know, almost didn't survive to become the George Orwell we knight. He would have died as Eric Blair and probably never would have heard of him. Uh, certainly, almost Catalonia would never have been written. But even more important and much more impactful, as you guys know, is two subsequent books that come much later. And of course, not, actually, not that much later, but uh, Animal Farm, which has been, to probably again, remains one of the most powerful and accessible, accessible if I didn't want the allegory of the Russian Revolution, how powerful it is, what a stark warning it is for uh, a revolution of that kind. Um, and then also goes on to write 1984. Both of those books are immense contributions to the 20th century, now the 21st century, to awaken us to the threat of uh, state control, mind control, thought control, destruction or elimination of history, destruction of independent thought, etc., etc. Um, and uh, that almost didn't happen because uh, he joined uh, the poem, and the poem was not okay with Stalin. Stalin wanted to eliminate any kind of divergent views because he wants to control the narrative. Fortunately for all of us, George Orwell's wife gave him a warning, as you guys know, he fled out the back door <laughs> to the benefit of you and I and millions of others beyond him. So with that, we're going to stop the Spanish Civil War right there. Uh, much to come. That war still remains resonant. Still, that the issues brought up, whether it's the death of truth in a war, objective opinions, uh, allowing fear to dictate narrative, etc., etc., remain just as present as did back then. I recommend you guys, uh, if you're able and have time, to dig deeper. So, with that, that's the end of this lecture. Take care, everybody.